<laughs> oh, yes. No ways. I love it. I'm going to have to get that one. <laughs> I likewise. Yeah, yeah. That's this, awesome. this has been with me for many years. <laughs> that how is many, so cool. How many Seriously. Does have? All right. We are here with Dr. Grace Lee. A massive welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. You have an incredible story. And uh, yeah, we're just super excited to be chatting with you. I'm excited. Yeah. To, I was excited for this as well. <laughs> <laughs> so Grace, your early childhood memories are generally uh, pretty fond ones. Uh, what was uh, what was it like day to day when you were a young girl? What was life like? It, well, it was very different. You know, the, the death of my mother really changed things for me. But before that, you know, from zero to kind of like eight years old, childhood was normal. I didn't, I didn't feel any different. You know, my mom was my best friend. She was my cheerleader. She was my, my mother. And she was like the light of my life. She was my whole life. And I was a happy child. You know, I was, I look back on my report cards, you know, from zero to eight years old, report cards from elementary school. And all of my teachers would say, oh, Grace is a happy girl. She's, she's always happy. She's always cheerful. And so it was just like life as usual. Mm, well, nothing's changed because you definitely seem like a very <laughs> heavy person now, which is so cool. <laughs> so you mentioned your mom was a cheerleader, like, and she, and your best friend, like, in what way was she your cheerleader? She was always encouraging me to learn English. So English was not my first language okay. and neither was hers. <laughs> neither was hers. She was always encouraging me to do well in school, but not, not the, not like bickering me. Like she didn't have to, she didn't, wasn't demanding. She just did it in a loving way. And she was my cheerleader. She, you know, I read her bedtime stories. It's usually the other way around. Right. But I would yeah. read them and she would listen and she would encourage me to keep going. You know, she would encourage me to play. She would encourage me just like, that and in, in a friend to friend kind of way and I didn't feel annoyed at all by her uh, uh, how amazing is that and it's a great yeah. idea is it get your your kid to to read your <laughs> the bedtime story to you <laughs> yeah yeah it's very clever it's like dads telling their little sons to fetch them beers from the fridge and stuff <laughs> <laughs> but where did you uh, actually grow up then okay zero to eight it was like half and half between Hong Kong and Canada oh uh, okay cool cool yeah, so we traveled a lot. I mean, at that time, my, my parents were trying to decide where to settle. And ultimately, they were very fearful of the 1997 handover, mm. Hong Kong to China handover, right? So they didn't want me, they didn't, I guess they didn't see a future for me in Hong Kong. They didn't want me to stay there. And they wanted me to have a North American upbringing. Mm. So yeah. were there a lot of people that actually left Hong Kong uh, in 97 or before? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like there is. I mean, a lot of people from my parents' generation and even slightly younger, like 10 years younger as well, have, have left Hong Kong and they've settled all over the place. Not just Canada. Canada is a hot spot. North America is a hot spot, I think, because during that era, you know, that generation was seeing North America as kind of like the land of milk and honey with opportunities and wealth and things like that. Mm -hmm. So then that's why that's why today there's like these huge populations of Chinese citizens in certain pockets in North America. And those are like the popular places that people choose. Mm, for sure. Wow. It's pretty crazy what's happening at the moment there, isn't it? It must be kind of weird for you to, to look at it and, and, and think that, you know, you could have been there just as easily. Yeah. I have to say I have a lot of mixed emotions about it. Weird is, yeah, weird is true. I do feel that way. And I also feel very emotional about it in some ways too. I still have relatives in Hong Kong who are participating in the protests. Hmm. Yeah. And I, I know that there's, it's very highly divided and very charged environment now too. Whew. Yeah. It's, it's always pretty scary, isn't it? When, when people have, when you're in big groups of people and, and there's lots of strong emotions, it's, it's kind of a, it's a, you know, very sort of a tenuous situation. It is. And, you know, I have to say, I am so grateful for the things that have happened in my life. And for me to be here in this country, in this city where I am, I'm very grateful for what I do have. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Wow. So Dr. Grace, you always had and, and still actually do have lots of dreams and aspirations. Um, but what, what were some of those as a, as a young girl? 
before eight, I, eight is such a pivotal age for me. Before eight, you know what? I wasn't a dreamer. You know, at that age, zero, to, I can't remember anything before, maybe four years old. I don't remember anything younger than, like, than four, but, you know, four to eight, I was not a dreamer. I was just more of an in the moment kind of person, just enjoying what is in front of me right here, right now. And I didn't have this ability yet to think about what I want in the future or what I dream of growing up to be. And those questions were never asked. And that's the, that's how my kind of like the hiccups I have right now with the school systems. They, my teacher has never asked and neither did my mom, but I guess she was more worried about other things of raising me as a, as a girl. But I, so I never, I never knew that you could ask these things. <laughs> that's, well, yeah. And then you, you've mentioned it like a couple of times now. So everything actually uh, changed for you when you were kind of eight years old, kind of tragedy struck. So maybe you kind of just want to take us through that event. Yeah, it was a very, it was one night it happened on the night of my birthday. Oh, and yeah. what happened, what happened was my family was involved in a car accident. So it was me, my father, my mother, and I have an older brother as well. Yeah, so the four of us were in the car and there wasn't a lot of education back then. And so my brother and I didn't have our seatbelts on. You know, it was, it was an old Pontiac, like um, an 80s Pontiac. And there was like these seats in the back where you can kind of like lay them down. So my parents put this, put lay the seats down for us and created like this bed so that we could be sitting in the back seat and without our seatbelts on. And so it was at nighttime and my mom was driving and there was a head on collision, high speed head on collision. And, you know, that was where everything changed. My mom had a head injury severe brain trauma and she was in a coma and uh, we were all injured. And that was like, that was the, the, the night that everything changed for me. And also the next year I was recovering from my injuries, the recovering mm. from being in the hospital, being bedridden for so long. Yeah. Mm. Wow. So sorry and to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. That's tragic. And on your birthday and it's just, mm. you know, so many years. And do you actually remember anything of that sort of, of that night or you know, I remember everything about that night. So there's something about me is I, I have a photographic memory and a truly a photographic memory. And I remember events very clearly. I remember words that were spoken very clearly. I, I remember like if I'm to stare at a page for a lengthened period of time, I actually see it. You know, so it helped me on exam taking, but I remember these things really clearly. So yeah, I, I do remember the details of it. Wow. That's a, a blessing and a curse. And, and in that case, definitely not, not nice to remember every detail. Goodness. And you mentioned that you were, sorry, go. no, no, I was just going to say like exactly what you said there, Craig, like, um, you, I don't know if you had nightmares or anything because I, I, I mean, I personally, I was involved in a head on collision when I was 16 on my motorbike. Um, and I remember zero, like literally my mind's blocked everything out and I'm, I'm super grateful for that. So I was just wondering, do you have any like nightmares or, you know, any thoughts about that at all ever? I've had nightmares before about it, of course, but it's not a recurring, like I'm um, grateful that it doesn't happen every day having nightmares of it. But when I was a child, I was just so caught up in what's my life going to be now. You know, I'm eight, I'm nine years old, I'm 10 years old. I'm just caught up in the moment of dealing with my life, my, my change of life that I, I'm not thinking about the night, you know, that the car accident night. So I was so mm. preoccupied for lack of a better term, just so preoccupied that it just didn't allow for me to keep thinking about the mm. events of, of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I do remember, of course, there are trigger moments, you know, I go through it and it reminds me of that day in the hospital, or it reminds me of when somebody came to me and told me the news, like there are triggers, of course. Mm, goodness. Wow. wow. And, and you, and you mentioned being injured and it, it could have actually quite easily left you a quadriplegic. Is that right? Yes. I had a, a C2, C3. So it was a cervical uh, vertebrae dislocation. There was a fracture there as well. I remember the doctor coming in and showing me the MRI wow. and it just the whole thing shifted. And my spinal cord was not injured because the a injury, there's a spinal cord would be quadriplegia, but I was fractions of a millimeter away from that. Wow. Very close. Yeah. And, and so you had a, you had this massive sort of halo brace on and, and you had to basically learn to walk again. Your, your legs had sort of become really weak and atrophied. Maybe just tell us about it, that some of that recovery. The recovery was long. So I was, I was 
in the hospital. I was bedridden with the, so there was a halo brace and then there were these weights that are attached to the halo brace mm -hmm. to give me traction so that it heals properly. And so I was in bed for months. And of course, when you're in bed, you get bed sores, you know, your skin starts to shed, your hair starts to fall out. And it's scary. You know, I'm, I'm like, I'm nine years old. I'm, I'm a young girl. I don't understand what's happening. And all I can see is my skin shedding off. And it's, huh. there's, it's, it's pussing, it's oozing. My hair is falling out by the handful. Wow. And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. And I don't know how long I'm going to be here. And so the recovery was when, when they told me, okay, you're, now is the time where you, you can stand up now. You're good to stand up now. Then there was that whole feeling that I don't have control over my body. I want to move my limbs. I want to stand up and you just can't. So it's just, it's scary. Yeah. And I look down and my, my legs are stick thin. <laughs> my arms wow. are thin as well. I had casts on my arms because I shattered both of my wrists too in that car accident. So the wrist came off, but I didn't have use of full use of my hands. So it was hard for me to use a walker. So there was the, I, I think I was a year of rehab going to physio and learning how to um, use my postural muscles again, use my leg muscles again, and just learning everything from scratch. And, and, and never mind the, the physical pain and trauma the, the the mental side of it is like you know probably double as bad to sort of manage and cope with hey it really was and you know i was in the children's hospital and they were brilliant with their care there was a clown I, i'm literally a, a, a man dressed up as a clown and he came alongside of me to help me to learn to walk right hmm. and so it's not that he was making a joke out of it of course he wasn't making a joke out of it yeah. but he, he he was this this a very light personality and empathetic personality. And he really knew his way with kids. And he visited me every day at my bedside. And then he would have conversations with me around walking, around rehabilitation, around getting up again to play with my friends, you know, things like that. And I remember wow. this clown, he was head to toe in a clown outfit. Huh. I never saw his face. It was fully painted face. And I remember wow. that I would be excited to see him. Huh. Do you, yeah. do you ever like kind of wish that you had seen who the clown was, you know, like <laughs> to, to say thanks, buddy, or, or lady, whoever it was, you got me through this. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I have a picture with him. So there's me in this full uh, halo brace, metal all around my head and my body. And I'm, I'm on the walker and the clown is standing beside me and we're both smiling. I'm grinning ear to ear. The clown <laughs> is smiling. And I, I don't remember his name. I, I think it was Bilbo. I could be wrong, but I think it's Bilbo the clown. In the moment, when, when I'm a kid, of course, I never thought, who's that person behind the clown? It's like, sort of like yeah. Santa Claus. You never, you don't want to pull the beard. <laughs> so I never thought of it. And as, a, and a, as an adult, I, I guess I just didn't think about that detail about, oh, who was that clown? <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. And, and if it's, you don't it's, mind, it's yeah. a great idea. Yeah, if you don't mind me asking, like, what, uh, what were the injuries of your brother and your father? My brother, you know, he was very fortunate. Both my brother and my father, they suffered very, the most minor of injuries. Hmm. So when we were in that backseat lying down, my parents had also bought a lot of groceries, these heavy, like four jugs of soy sauce, things like heavy glass jars. They fell on my brother. And so they knocked out his teeth, all of his front teeth. And so he had a lot of scars on his face and he just needed stitches. So one night in the hospital, he was out, he was discharged. Hmm. And then he had a lot of root canal, a lot of dental work that was necessary there. So that was him. My father, he was in the passenger side. So he had a seatbelt on. He was on the passenger side. He just had a, bro a few broken ribs and that's it. Wow. But, yeah. And at this stage, uh, Grace, I mean, did you, were you aware that your mother was, I mean, obviously you were aware, but did you know how serious it was or did, like, she had a brain injury and all this? I didn't know. I, wow. I, we were separated right from that car. So they, they needed to use the jaws of life to take her, to extract her body out of the vehicle. Wow. And at that time I was already conscious. I was sleeping throughout. And then I hear this loud crash and I'm awake and all I see is the roof of the car and flashing lights. Right. And, um, I didn't know what was happening. Thankfully I was moving in the car with my brother and we couldn't get out. And thankfully I didn't further injure my neck. Yeah. Right. Thankfully it didn't, that didn't happen. But that moment, that night, the hospital, the ambulance took me and my brother to children's hospital and took my mom to the regular hospital. And I never saw her 
extent, and I never saw her, and I didn't know the extent of her injuries. It wasn't until much wow. later that I did my own digging and I found out what happened. Wow, that's so sad. I'm so sorry. Um, and and talking about your your parents, um, I'm not too sure how close your relationship uh, ever was with your dad, but it sounds like even during this incredibly tough time, he didn't sort of try like reconnect and create another bond with you, and you basically. We were left to fend for yourself, you know, and uh, from from such a young age. What actually, what what was it like in those sort of years afterwards? Yeah. So when my mom was still with me, when she was still alive, I I didn't associate with my father. Like my brother and I didn't play with him. He didn't really. He wasn't the one that interacted with us. It was all our mother. Like she was the one that interacted with us. Everything, the day to day care, the playing, the playfulness, the learning. It was just my mom that did it. But of course, when you are born and you raised in that environment, you think it's normal. Mm. Right? I, we called him dad, like in mm. Chinese, we called him dad. But to us, that meant, oh, somebody who is just lives in the same house as you. Hmm. There was no reason behind, okay, what is a father? And so we never had a conversation. And then so when my mom passed away and my father was at my bedside in the hospital, that was like one of the first few conversations I ever had with him. No way. Yeah, it was like needing to get to know him from scratch. And I was nervous. I was like, oh, what do I do? What do I say to this person? Huh. Yeah, it was very, and, and I, and I assume he was the same way, very nervous. All of a sudden now he has two kids that he has to um, take care of and he doesn't really know how he doesn't know how he's going to do that because he never wow. did. Yeah. And, and so what did he do? Well, not, well, not, not too much in the way of conversation. Cause when I was in the hospital, I was more conversing and building relationships with, the, with my nurses, with that clown, Bilbo the clown. Mm-hmm. And with other visitors who came in the hospital, I mean, my dad was there. He would be this body that was present, but it was just like similar to home. He was a body that was present, but there wasn't a connection. There wasn't a relationship, right? So then that's how I saw it. Okay, there he is, the person I'm, I call dad in Chinese, but he's another, he's a body in the room, but I don't have a, a relationship with him and, and we just don't, we don't talk. So it was normal. Again, it was still normal to me. And I thought that everybody has that. Everybody's dad is like that. You know, I, you just don't think of it if you don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. And you were calling for your mom, I'd imagine. I mean, you must have been like, okay, well, you know, where's mom? Or were they just saying, no, she's, she's, she's not well? Or, I mean, what was the story you were being told? Yeah, that's exactly it. She's not well. She, yeah, she, yeah, she's not well. And she's being taken care of not here. This is a children's hospital, but she's being taken care of. Um, no, you can't see her yet, Uh, but Mm. she, she's, and then that's it. And, and that's the thing as a child, I was very passive and, Oh, can we pause? Yeah, No worries. Go ahead. (laughs) Go right ahead. (laughs) Okay. Go ahead. My my husband's. No, no worries. Go right ahead. (laughs) I I told them to pause. (laughs) (laughs) Can you unplug that? Yeah, I'm okay, he's gonna unplug that phone. No worries. No worries, <laughs> no worries at all. That's classic. No worries. That's okay. that's probably the first phone that's gone off in a podcast with us. Yeah, <laughs> old school phone. Uh, that's that's old school phone. <laughs> so we live in a condo, and that phone is what is how you people buzz. Ah. And so we got a delivery at the door. And oh, that's cool. Ah, uh, that's classic. I kind of we we kind of love it when like real life happens to people yeah. in the podcast because like yeah. you know that's how it is. That's real life. <laughs> oh <laughs> we'll leave that in. <laughs> oh, but my actual cell phone is turned off though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. oh, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Sorry about that. Okay, no worries. And sorry. So 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 afterwards, did you you went and lived at home? I assume like after you know the hospital. Is that what happened? Actually, no, we didn't because. My my so my dad was really indecisive of what to do with us, how to take care of us now as a, a newly single father, and we didn't have a communication. And so I think the only framework of parenting to him was discipline. You know, that was the only framework he had. And and he was trying I, I and I I'd like to say he was trying his best. I'd, I'd like to say that, but we didn't he, he didn't know what to do. And, and I guess he 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 always felt like he needed help. So we didn't go back home. So my, my my dad actually had a sister who was in the area and we spent a lot of time at her place. 
like our mm. aunt, I guess we spent a lot of time there and just like back and forth, not knowing, wow. not knowing where to settle and, and goodness, just this whole, okay, well, where are we going to live now? You know, that ki- kind of like instability. But as a child, like I said, I was very passive and I didn't think about it. Mm. I didn't, I didn't know how to think, you know, I didn't, what you don't know, you don't know. And so of I didn't course. know the kind of questions that you need to ask or so I just, I just took it as it came and I was very passive. Wow. It's quite fascinating. If you think like the meaning of words, right? Right. So like dad, like what is that? What is the action behind the word dad? And, and, and what does it mean to be a dad? And uh, these are like interesting sort of things, you know what I mean? Like he was theoretically your dad, but is that, is that a dad? Like, I don't know. It's just a, it's kind of a weird sort of a, a mind, a sort of thought experiment on, on what does it mean to be X, Y, Z, you know? Yeah, exactly. And take yeah. that one step further, the, what it means to be a dad, it kind of like it evolves when, when children get older and they have different needs mm. and they have different abilities, you know, that, that, that definition and that relationship evolves and necessarily so. Hmm. Yes. And were you going to school like later on that year or did you, I mean, when you started to recover a bit more, like how did, what happened with your schooling at that stage? Well, it, it kind of like there was a pause at some point mm. because it wasn't, I wasn't able, but you know, I had the most, most fantastic teachers and they brought the homework to me at the hospital. Mm. <laughs> fantastic teachers. And so I did my homework because I, I always did that as I was told because I was very passive. So I just did as <laughs> I was told. I did the homework and then my teachers would come and collect it. So they passed me. So I passed the grades. Goodness. Right? In the hospital, I passed the grades and I had to find time to go to rehab and to do physio and all that. But because my dad was so indecisive, he actually moved us from so many different schools. Oh. And I never built any friendships in that time. <laughs> so it was very... So hard. Yeah, it was really, it was difficult. Yeah. Wow. And, and, and as a result of all of this, you were, you know, sort of fending for yourself and you were surviving actually later on, on, on like $2 a day. Um, cause you were working at a restaurant. I mean, how, how does, tell us a little bit about like that whole situation. Right. So I had to backtrack a little bit. I didn't start working in the restaurant until there was another critical point in my life. You know, mm. I, I, when I was around the age of 10, what happened was like, um, my dad had disappeared, you know, and mm. so my, my brother and I were like, Oh, where, where'd he go? You know? And we were told that he had gone to China, but we weren't sure where or for what reason. Right. And mm. so we, when he, so he was gone and I can't remember exactly how long he was gone, but it was in the ballpark of months. Right. And, and not years, but months, you know, and he came back, you know, when he came back, he came back with a lady, an old a lady from, from China. And he kind of introduced her as, oh, this is your new mother. Hmm. Oh. Yeah. So he, so soon after that, they set up a ceremony and they were married. And so my brother and I were at that, at that wedding. It was a very simple wedding, very quickly organized, very fast organized. So it was very uh, quick wedding. They were married and then um, she was pregnant. And so she had, they had um, one daughter, right? And then when, like shortly after the birth of their, their baby, you know, my, my dad kind of like, he, he came into the room and he told me, uh, he told me, he was like, you know, Grace, I, I, I don't think I can, I don't think I can take care of you anymore. You know, I, I have a, I have a family, I have a family now and there's like responsibilities. I know so you, you, you understand, like you, you understand, right? I, I think I'm, I, I don't, I don't have the ability anymore to, to care for you. Um, there's just too much right now going on. Right. Right. And so that, that critical moment for me was this, like right in that moment, I didn't question anything because I was still this passive girl. So I didn't question anything, but I was scared. Right. I was scared. And I was like, mm-hmm. Oh, I, I realized that, Oh my gosh, I'm, res- I'm going to be responsible for the rest of my life. Myself, me only. I, I am responsible for the rest of my life. And I didn't know, I didn't know what I was going to do or how I was going to do it. Right. And so that was the, the time that I started working in this, this restaurant. And mm. because as, when you're a minor, you don't, I didn't get paid a salary, right. I didn't get paid a salary because it's like illegal. <laughs> it's illegal. It's not legal to, <laughs> to be a, a, a registered employee at a restaurant. But what I, what I got, what I realized really soon, this was like a very young entrepreneurial side of me. I realized that when you work for a restaurant and you don't get a salary, you can still get tips. 
you can earn tip money. And all I had to do was treat my customers really well and <laughs> talk to them or to be really cute with them, you know, and to bring out some charming qualities of being a girl working at a restaurant. And I did that and they would give me tips. You know, huh. I, would, I would tell them stories about these dreams I had of, of going to school in the future and they would give me tips. And so I kept doing that, doing that. And that's what I mean. And that was my dollar a day, $2 a day was from tip money. They would settle their bill and, and I would go and clean their table and there would be like a coin on the table. And that was mine. Wow. You know, and I, I was super <laughs> excited. And, right? and that's when I quickly realized that I get to keep that money. That's my money. Huh. And so I would like wow. put it in my pocket and then, you know, every dollar, every coin I would put in my pocket and it would be like, that's all I could see. You know, that was, it was what I lived for in the moment. It was just collecting these coins and, yeah. and, and oh, I'll figure out later what I'm going to do with it. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so that was how, that's how the $2 a day came about. It was wow. those activities. And, and are you in touch with your dad at all anymore? N no, I'm not. Uh, um, yeah. I mean, I'm not surprised that I'm like... Yeah, there's this mix of emotions when you talk about it, like of, of sadness, but also kind of anger in terms of how you treat it as a youngster. I mean, it just makes no sense whatsoever. Mm. It's like, yeah, it's kind of disgraceful in a, in a way, you know, so it's, I'm really sorry to hear that. Yeah. I appreciate it, Gareth. It's interesting. You use the word anger there. Mm. It's interesting, though. I never felt angry. Mm. Right. So the way I never felt angry at him the way I internalized it as a 10 year old girl was more on myself. It had, it had a really huge knock on my self-esteem and myself and my sense of self-worth. So mm -hmm. it didn't, it didn't exhibit as anger towards him. Rather it exhibited as I'm not worthy of love. Hmm. I'm not a worthy human being. Nobody wants me. Nobody cares about me. That's how it exhibited. There was no anger there. It was very strong on that side that I didn't even know how to be angry. I was just, all I could think about was nobody wants me. I could die right now, right here, and no one would know and no one would care. And that's, hmm. that's the emotion that I had. Wow. He must have felt like super alone. And I guess, uh, you know, I don't know what, what it was like. Were you ashamed? Were you uh, these sort of things like in yeah. the shame? The shame came later. Yeah, the shame came later. At 10, 11, 12, 13, that age was aloneness, destitution, um, feeling like I'm worthless. I'm, I'm, I'm worth lower than dirt. You know, that was the feeling that, you know what, I might as well just do the world a favor and just die right now and just get it over with. And, and no one will care. Right. That was my feeling. You know, it's just, I was just the low of lows at that moment. The shame came later though. I didn't feel shame mm -hmm. yet. It was later on that happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So you were like suicidal, you, you yes. reckon? Yeah. And were you telling anyone about this? The no, feelings at all? I wasn't because I felt I couldn't because I felt worthless. Right. I felt like, oh, who, who cares? No one would care anyway. So why bother? You know, I'm not just going to, no one cares. You know, I was the abandoned one. Nobody loves me. No one even likes me. So I didn't even think that it was in my, in my, uh, possibility to even tell anyone i didn't think i had the right to tell anyone because who would care it was like that that's how low i i had gotten and you kind of wonder like did, does your father did, did he ever like go i wonder how grace is doing or like i hope she's okay you know like how do you how do you physically do that and and then still basically say that he's too busy um with responsibilities like hello like <laughs> you know what i mean it's it's just quite it's almost impossible to sort of comprehend that, that someone could do that, you know? He felt, he must've felt like he couldn't, you know, he must've felt like he couldn't take care of me as well, right? He couldn't do all of that and handle, like they went on and had another child. So they have two, like he has two other daughters. Like I have two half sisters, right? So maybe he, he must've felt that he can't, you know, when you say I can't and, and you kind yeah. of like believe it, right? So that must've been his, mindset at the time there's no way i could confirm that yeah of course Nothing i could right i could never be in his shoes and i can't ask him right now i never did ask him so i don't know all i know is what happened and how i internalized it right and so it's of just I, and i never questioned it oh i never questioned it i didn't know that you could ask questions and question people i just didn't know yeah wow <laughs> and, and yeah. Were, you, were you able to confide in your brother or at, at all or were you not close with him I, I wasn't. And it's interesting because my brother stayed with him. 
it was just me. I was the one no that was, that left. Yeah. And that's why even more, it just piled on to the fact that I'm the unwanted one. Hmm. It just piled on. Like I'm the unwanted one. It wasn't that I'm a girl because he had two girls. It's not because hmm. it's not that it's not that Chinese mentality of, yeah. Yeah. you know, you've heard of this. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Yeah. Like, right. Yeah. The girls are unwanted because they want yeah. the man, male to pass on the family name. It wasn't that. It wasn't that. that two daughters. So it wasn't that I couldn't figure it out. So I thought, Oh, it's me. You know what? It's just me. No one. It's just me that people don't like. And wow. I just expanded that to the whole world. Pe- people hate me. I, I, I'll never know why they just hate me. There's something wrong with me. Mm. And, and, my, and so Grace, I sorry, sorry. I thought you were finished. No, carry on. Oh, so I, I just, my brother and I kind of, we parted ways uh, in and around that time as well when I left and we just never got back in touch kind of thing. And he never reached out. I never reached out because I didn't feel empowered to. And it just kind of like um, fell tapered from there. Wow. Mm. And, and you don't have that curiosity to know who your brother is, at least. I mean, that doesn't sound like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just asking, like, do you at all? Back then? No, I didn't. Back then, the only thing I could, I was wallowed up in my destitution. It just swallowed me this whole lack of self-worth and self-esteem that just swallowed me that I didn't have that the energy or the mental capacity to think, to be curious. I didn't have that. I gave up. I gave up on life. But how about now? Like, do you, do you ever have that curiosity where you're like, oh, I wonder what my brother looks like or all these yes. sort of things? Actually, yes, I do. And we saw each other a couple of years ago. Wow. Oh, wow. How was yeah, that? There was a reunion a couple of years ago. <laughs> I, I oh my gosh um it was casual it was super casual so i met him so he has a wife and he has two kids now and i met the whole family right the whole mm. family so, so it was strange like, hey. yeah wow. first time i ever met his kids who are i guess my niece and niece and nephew right so yeah. the very first time and it was very casual his kids are quite young so he introduced me as aunt auntie grace and so that was that was very kind of him. He didn't have to, but he did. So that was very kind. And we had a conversation, catching up however you can catch up, you know? Yeah. And it was just super casual. And I appreciated the time that he spent to reach out to me and to to have lunch together. It was a lunch. And I really appreciated that. Yeah. And, and would you know, the, the next layer is like, do you think you'll ever be inclined to maybe reach out to your father? I'm not inclined at the moment. Mm. I'm more on the line of, well, I see this, the thing is where I, if I don't know what he's thinking, if there's any a side of him that is resentful of me or angry at me for not supporting him in his older age, or there could be some of that going on. I don't know. Right. And so in some ways reaching out to him could trigger old wounds or could cause more anxiety or something like that. And I could never know. Right. So I'm more on the lines of, well, if he's, if he's fine where he's at and he is having, being taken care of and being supported, then there's no need for me to go in and, and stir the pot a little bit. You know, mm-hmm. even my presence in his life coming, showing up again could stir the pot in negative ways. And I, I don't, and I don't know if it will. Yeah, right? So you're so caring about him in that scenario again. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I also don't want to be a target again either. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Right. So there's like there's this two two way kind of thinking, and there hasn't been yeah nothing has been brought to my attention where mm. I need to make a decision of that sort. Totally. So, yeah. Exactly. Totally <laughs> understand. Well, it's very complex and uh, deep emotions, and it's these kind of scenarios are obviously very hard to comprehend unless you're in them. You know what I mean? So. Um, yeah, very complex. So, so, so Grace, um, as is often the case uh, in the universe, there is a some or other balance, and uh, it came in the form of, of two customers that that you served at the restaurant one day. Um, can you tell us more about that encounter? Oh my gosh, that was another milestone. See, I have a lot of life changing milestones in my life, and my life has been <laughs> riddled with these life changing moments. So it happened when I was fourteen. Life was going on as usual. I'm taking coins off the table that people left behind. And that's like my future that I could see. Right. And one day this elder couple came in to dine and I waited on them as usual. And they were very astute and they were very observant as well. They communicated with my dad as well. Uh, so they, they, they know him. Hmm. Um, 
they know him and they saw my dad in, in cer- certain circumstances. So they're aware of who he is and things like that. Mm. And they were very astute. And so they knew that they noticed, I didn't tell them, they noticed that I needed a place to stay. So when they, after their meal, they settled the bill and they kind of asked me, um, do you need to place to stay? You know, you can stay with us. Why don't mm. you stay with us? And I'm desperate. I don't know these people. I've never seen them before. They're strangers, right? But I followed them home that night. Mm, wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I packed my bag, everything I own in a backpack. I followed them home that night. And they led me down, you know, a few blocks. We, we, they just live very close to where I was working. And a few blocks down, and I remember it, I got up to their, their walkway, very humble, yellow wooden house with a kind of like the panel, one story house. And they, so they led me into the house. They didn't, they didn't even lock their door, walked into the home. They led me up these narrow staircase with a <laughs> carpeted staircase. I remember the staircase, turn right. And there's this huge bedroom with yellow wow. walls. And the ceiling is like slanted on one side and they had this huge furniture from, from British, the 1960s in British with cherry wood. <laughs> and then they come in, they, they turn to me and they say, welcome home. Wow. I'm shocked. They say, welcome home. And they say, Grace, you can stay with us as long as you like. Hmm. Make this your home. You're welcome to anything you want. Help yourself to anything you want. You're welcome to stay here for as long as you need. And that's, hmm how it started just like that wow how did you feel (laughs) you know i'm ashamed to say i didn't trust them that's how i felt i felt i felt glad notice i didn't say grateful right i felt glad that it was off the street right i felt glad that there was somebody who was providing me with a bed and the comfort of a room and some stability because they said i could stay as long as i needed so there was some stability there and I was glad about it, but I didn't trust them. I felt that this was going to be temporary, that they were going to kick me out sometime and I didn't know when, and I just had to be on my feet, on, on my tiptoes. That's how I was feeling in that moment. So I didn't trust them. And it's so surprising, I didn't, yeah. yeah, I didn't trust them and I didn't want to open up my heart to them in case they would hurt me too. Oh, wow. yeah. so, so where were you actually living at that stage? At that stage, so my parents, I call them my parents now. So when I say my parents, I'm actually referring to that couple, <laughs> right? They were in a village, and I kid you not, it was a tiny, tiny village in central Canada in the province of Manitoba, which is like a prairie province, you know, responsible for a lot of the exports of grain and, and crops. You know, there's livestock there too as well. It's like a huge, the prairie provinces are like Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta. Yeah. And they produce a lot of the wheat and the crops of, for the country and exportation as well. So we're known for that in Canada, but it comes from those prairie provinces. Mm. And, and so there's a village in the southern part of Manitoba, the province of Manitoba, uh, where that village has a population of only, only 800 people. It's mm. that small. <laughs> and I wow. represent the diversity in that. <laughs> I represent the diversity in the whole community and the surrounding communities. You're rich. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So, my so needless to say, like the whole community, everyone's Caucasian, and so are my adoptive parents as well. They're they are Caucasian, British Caucasian. (laughs) They were living there. They were living there at the time, and that's where they they raised me. And that's where they, it was. So people there in that town, they don't, they don't lock their front doors. Mm, and wow. so that's why they, they felt compelled to care for someone. They saw a child in need and they reached out and that's what they naturally did. Wow. So, so were you living on the streets before that? Did you say like, yeah, there were times where I, i I had to, you know, and there were times where I created these excuses to, stay in friends sofas you know like oh can, you know just mm. crash at your place like make some sort of an excuse or wow. there were yeah i had to really scramble a lot i had to be creative i had to uh, be yeah to like insert myself <laughs> insert, mm-hmm. yeah i had to be creative so it was a lot of a lot of doing that a lot of shuffling around a lot of moving so that's why i i just took everything i owned in one in one bag and that's all like all my possessions in one in one bag until <laughs> until my parents gave me that place when I was 14. Then, wow. yeah, when I trusted them, that's when I really settled in. Hmm. Wow. And, and how long did you think it took you to actually trust them? And 
what was it like in the beginning for them? Was it tough that you didn't trust them? I guess, or maybe you didn't even show it. <laughs> so I can't speak for them. I can't speak for my parents. And yeah. I would love for you to chat with them. You'll see that they're just phenomenal people. They would make a great, great addition to have a conversation with you. They are great. human beings. But I, so I can't speak for them. But I can say that they were very patient. They were very patient with me. Right. Cause I refused to develop a relationship and it's noticeable because I didn't want to, I didn't talk to them. I didn't open my heart to them. I just mm. went in and out. Right. But I didn't develop a conversation. I didn't carry the conversation farther. They tried to ask me questions and I didn't open up to them. So they're adults. You can sense that. Right. So I don't know what, what their experience was. I, I can't, I don't want to speak for them. <laughs> I've asked them before and they've, they've shared with me. Uh, but for me, it was just, I, I was trying to protect myself. I didn't want to get hurt again because I've been hurt before and I felt like, well, I need to be on my toes so that I, I just not, I'm not going to get, let myself get hurt again. And that way I can expect the worst, which is I'm going to get kicked out and I'm going to get abandoned again. I'm going to be the unwanted kid again. So I just want to, I'd rather just expect that. That way I don't get hurt. Of course. Wow, that's a very difficult base to kind of start off from things, you know, like that sort of thinking. And um, what, what was, the, what was the, the turning point at all? Or it was there one, do you think, that uh, and you started maybe opening up a little bit? It took me two years. <laughs> <laughs> two years of this testing, you know, testing their, their sincerity. Like I, I did things to test them. I did things to challenge them. And I, I was just trying to see whether or not they were sincere and they meant what they said. So two years later, and I was 16 already, I had this, it was literally this waking aha moment. I woke up one morning and my dad likes to garden. My, when I'm saying dad here, yeah, I mean yeah. my adoptive mm, father. Yeah, totally. My dad loves to garden and he would be planting flowers all around the house. One morning I woke up and there was, I had a window in my bedroom and I looked down and I saw him planting and he was chatting with one of the neighbors and back then the walls were so thin I could hear his voice upstairs on the top talking to the neighbor <laughs> and and he sounded so sincere talking to that neighbor such a sincere man hmm. and then that's when it hit me right there he was holding the flowers in his gardening gloves and everything hmm. and that's when it hit me oh my gosh they're the real deal they're here to stay they meant they meant it they're the real deal and that was when I realized they are not going to abandon me. They meant what they said. It's two years now and I'm still here and they're still providing for me. They mean it. And then that's when I realized that, you know what? I want to give back to them. One day I want to give back what they've mm -hmm. given to me. And I also realized that I am, I have to be independent. I have the rest. I'm, eight, I'm 16 now, two years later, I'm graduating from high school. I need to be independent. I need to start mm -hmm. to think about my life now. And I told myself that the only way I knew how to be independent was through education. So my education was my ticket to freedom. If I wanted the life that I wanted, the independence. And that was the same day I finally allowed myself to dream. The first time ever was when I realized that now I could find, I don't have to worry about surviving. My parents are here. They're providing for me. They're sincere. I trust them. Finally, I had the mental capacity to think about other things. Before that, the only thing I could think about was worrying that I'm going to get kicked out again. Worrying about food, clothing, shelter. I was worried about mm. those things. So how could I think about my future? So when I finally, when my parents finally took that off my plate, that's when I could finally allow myself to dream of a, of a future that I could possibly have. Mm. Yeah. It's such a big lesson here, just when you have love and that, that genuine, sincere love and the support from a family yeah. and all of us who have had that from a young age, you, you don't realize how lucky you are because it, as you say, it gives you that sort of bandwidth to, to dream and to look out of your, you know, think what are, what are the possibilities in my life? And, uh, and, and so you only sort of got that at 16. Yeah. And so I think it's like a real opportunity for, for all of us that have had that from a young age to, to really be grateful for that. You know, you don't even realize you, you have that until, it, until you hear a story like this. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? It was so freeing. Hmm. It was so freeing because I finally stopped giving up on life. Hmm. And I realized in that moment, you know what? I had given up. Because I didn't feel, think that I was worth of, worthy of a future. I didn't think mm. it was possible. I didn't think it was in the cards for me. Hmm. 
right? And now I realize, you know what? Yes, it is. And I don't want to give up anymore. I want to try. I want to have a better future. I didn't know exactly the details of it, but mm. I wanted something more. I wanted to be better. And I knew that no one's going to, no one's going to give that to me and no one's going to support me there. I have to get it on my own. And so that's mm. when I decided the only way I know how is to do well in school. Hmm. And, and, and can, what, what does that uh, first bit of affection like? Like, did you, were you affectionate before then or did you give them a hug or what was it like? like <laughs> well, I had, because I was very conservative, you know, yeah. as a teenager, I was very conservative. I took it slow. I start, I initiated conversations when they asked me questions. I started to expand on them now. You know, I was mm. no longer so cold to them. I would stay up late talking to them now and I would share things you know, and they were not intrusive. They just let me talk. And they were very respectful of boundaries. They were very respectful and sensitive to my trauma, my childhood traumas. It was just phenomenal. And eventually, I opened up to them completely. Mm. Completely. And so they knew everything that I was going through. And they had tremendous amount of empathy for me. They have two kids of their own. And mm. so they and they have grandchildren as well. So they introduced me to the family and everyone just accepted me as one of their own. Wow. So food, clothing, shelter was the first thing they gave me. And that allowed me the freedom to think about my life. But this, the most important thing they gave me that I didn't, wasn't able to accept until I was 16 was the sense of belonging, like a true authentic sense of belonging. And I know how in incredibly that important that is for everyone as a human being, how important that sense of belonging is. Mm. Uh, yeah. It must have been a, a, a really, I mean, like you said, you don't want to speak for them, but it must have been such an amazing sort of turning point for them just to say like, they could tell like that you, the, your, your guard sort of dropped and, and you were just, <laughs> you were just there and just being, and, and it must have been a really amazing, because two years is a long time. Hey, if you think about it, like, it's a real long time of like them hoping that, that they'll get to that point, I, I presume, you know, and uh, yeah, it must've been really magical for them as well. Yeah. I mean, but my parents were always so laid back. They didn't <laughs> fret about it. They didn't feel anxious or panic about it. You know, they didn't threaten me or try to discipline me. They were so laid back about it. And that's mm. what I love about them is that they just, the, their approach and their attitude towards life is something that I started to emulate mm -hmm. when I, when I started connecting with them, I started to emulate that, you know, cause mm -hmm. for me, it was like, you know, that, that sense of belonging. I never felt like I belonged to anyone or with anyone until that day when I was 16. Wow. And they sound like incredible people, like you said, and uh, definitely with, uh, with the chat, that's for sure. Um, it's amazing what um, uh, compassion and, you know, empathy does. And it just really, allows people to feel safe in an environment and it's such an important thing for us all to sort of practice more of um so you actually mentioned that you kind of took control of your life and you know you basically really started focusing on school and uh you know with all that determination and hard work you basically got yourself a scholarship uh, so so that's amazing but like can you tell us what was your mindset at the time and what did it feel like getting a scholarship my mindset of the time was very simple. It was do or die. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and I mean that quite literally, actually, where, you know, in that phase of kind of like non-belonging, not having a, a, a place to call home that those few years of my childhood, I really felt like I, I might as well just die, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I acted upon that, right? And so for me, although I had my parents, there was no allowance. They didn't give me money, right? They didn't give me, they didn't give me money. They didn't give me, um, they didn't give me support my education. It was just an unwritten understanding that I had to be independent. Hmm. And I, didn't, I didn't fault them for that. And I didn't blame them. I wasn't angry or upset. It was just an, a, I don't know, a rude awakening when I was 16 that I had to be responsible. And it was just this huge a huge responsibility like the world was on my shoulders type of responsibility it was like that and i was like oh my gosh you know what if i don't do this i'm going to die Jeez. you know because 18 i'm out i want to i want to be independent if i can't if i can't provide for myself and i can't have a bowl of rice you know that's always the thing in chinese is like can you afford a bowl of rice you know there's a saying in chinese you know and and so 
that's what I kept thinking about this bowl of rice. If I can't afford that, I will die. So it was for me, do or die. Wow. <laughs> right. And so that there was a sense of urgency there. I got to do and I got to do now. Hmm. Right. So then that was when, as soon as I had that, that age, that moment of agency at 16, I applied myself in school. And for me, it was like, I needed to get scholarship. I can't afford to pay for tuition. I don't know how much it costs, but I know I can't afford it because I'm making $2 a day in tip money. Yeah. Right? So I couldn't afford it. And so it was like, I knew about the scholarships you could win, but you had to have a certain GPA. You had to do really well. You had to like, right. So I was like, okay, how can I small town grace afford and be competitive for these scholarships? I have to work hard. So yeah. I did everything that I could to compete for these scholarships so that I could afford to go to school. Yeah. Nothing trumps hard work. Seriously, at the end of the day, you know what I mean? Like it, it, you don't, it, it, literally, I think that's what it comes down to. I mean, you know, you obviously can work smart and be clever and these sort of things, but seriously, hard work is that sort of um, key factor. You know what I mean? That, mm. um, that not everyone puts in and they don't understand why they like don't necessarily get what they want because that's what life is about. That's what striving and, and thriving is about is actually doing hard work. You know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the, you know, also like the fact that you had been through such tough times gave you that, that extra push. And, and, you know, it's one of those things that in life, again, that you, you don't always know why or how or what, but when you have tough times, they can motivate you to, to go that, that just that little step further. And uh, it's just, it's a, it's a true testament that what, you know, what you've been through and you, and it, it, it drove you, you know, and you might not have ended up where you are now if you'd had an easy laid back life, you know, who knows, you, you don't never really know, but, but at the same time, it definitely drove you at that stage, which is amazing. Yeah, it did. It did. Looking back on this now, I totally agree with you 100%. But I have to admit, there were moments when I was in my late teens and early 20s, where I was kind of like envious and kind of mm. regretful that I didn't have parents to provide for me. You know, because of course, you go on, you meet, I met new friends. And mm. my friends have their parents pay for their college tuition, or my friends have mm. parents who give them money. And I see this because they're my, they became my close friends. And I'm mm. kind of like envious. And I kind of feel like, oh, you know what? I think, you know, I might have been farther along if I had parents to provide for me or if I had um, some, some safety net. You know, I would think I had these thoughts when I was, you know, in, during that stage. And I was kind of sort of like regretful, jealous, mm. you know, envious and regretful of it. But I still wasn't angry towards my mm. father. I wasn't angry. You know, I, st I just felt like this ping of, I really envy that. I wish I had that, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but now you know, I'm more mature looking back on it. You know what? Things had to happen the way they did. I mean, they really did. And that journey is one that I'm extremely grateful for. Hmm. Hmm. Amazing. Wow, Grace. So, so Grace, just moving forward a little bit, you, you know, after your first degree, you actually ended up moving to Edinburgh, um, <laughs> which is also a part of your like brave, you know, just going ahead with things. And, um, and you studied um, neuroscience, which is which you eventually actually received your PhD back in Canada for. Um, yes. Maybe maybe just tell us about you know your research and and, and that journey, and um, and then we'll move on to like how, how the sort of bureaucracy of things can can be affected uh, in the university scenarios. Sure, it was an interesting decision. My interest in neuroscience was seeded when I learned later on that my mom died of a brain trauma. Hmm. And I myself had a near spinal cord injury. All of that is central nervous system, right? Brain and nerves. All of that is like CNS. And so that's where neuroscience comes into play. And at that time, it was like the early 2000s. And neuroscience was like the burgeoning field. It was a, it was a younger field than it is now. And there's st there was so much that we didn't know about the brain. And, I, and so it sealed, it sealed in me this interest to help patients like my mom who had brain injuries or even brain disease. And so that's when I decided, I think I want, an, I want to major in neuroscience so that I can give back and help people mm. like, like me and, and help families like, like mine who went through that trauma of losing a loved one. And, neuro, and Edinburgh, Scotland came in when I thought to myself, okay, I have, just, I have just achieved one of the biggest challenges of my life that I funded my whole bachelor's degree and I was able to move. And I was able to do all of this on my own. And that was a huge 
feat. It was not a small feat. It was a huge feat. And I felt extremely grateful and extremely proud of myself for that. Although I didn't allow myself to be proud of myself. And that's a different story. <laughs> I didn't allow it. It was just, that was just my, my own, the self-esteem issue. Right. And I, and I said, okay, my next challenge in my life, my next challenge is more on a personal level. I want to challenge myself to be outside of my comfort zone in a personal level. And the way that looked like, the way I shaped it to be was moving to a country where I knew nobody. I didn't understand the culture. I've never been there before. I, and I also am, again, the minority, you know? And so I was looking about uh, uh, neuroscience programs around the world and Scotland came up and Edinburgh came up and they were a very prestigious program for neuroscience. Very prestigious. In my year, they only let eight people in. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Eight. Well done. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, so I've, I've, up until this point, I've trained myself to be competitive and I'm super competitive. And I'm like, I want one of those spots. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be there. Right. So then I, I started competing. And of course, they, you have to jump through a lot of hurdles to be accepted into a program like that. And I did it. Yeah. I was working at the same time and I was applying at the same time and, and finishing up my degree requirements at the same time. So it was all wow. of this. And I was, I competed for it and I got it. Wow. I got it. And then it was about, okay, now I got it. Now I need to worry about how am I going to afford this? <laughs> <laughs> first things first. <laughs> yeah. So I wasn't, the best. Later. <laughs> so I wasn't the best planner back then. <laughs> When I have to admit, I'm a much better planner now than when I was 21, 22 back then. But that was my that was the way I had approached it. Not the best approach, but it, it, it definitely put me in another do or die situation, you see. Another urgent situation. Okay, I have to afford this. So then when you are in that state where you know your reasons, you know your why I want to do it, because I knew I wanted to help families and to give back. That was my why thinking about my mother that was my why mm. and then I had a sense of urgency as well it was do or die so combined with those I was very creative and I was very very resourceful and the money showed up wow what a so, powerful combination hey Jeez. yeah yeah exactly so, so, so I mean obviously it doesn't show up like you, you're working extra hard burning no, no. a candle like what, what what were you doing to to sort of you know earn the money to pay for all of this Okay, so in one part, I yeah. was working as kind of like a, I think my title was research tech one, which means a, an assistant. <laughs> so I'm an assistant <laughs> in, in a laboratory and I'm working with other PhD students and master students. And there's a professor that oversees the whole lab and I'm doing the grunt work of research. You know, the stuff that students don't want to do, they give to me that kind of work. <laughs> right? Because I'm like I, I started work, I started doing that when I was, I think, 21, 22, around there. And so I was the grunt in that lab that people just give me the stuff they don't want to do that takes up time, that's repetitive and redundant. And then I, I work hard and I do it. So that was the salaried work that I did. Mm -hmm. And then um, on, the side, uh, on the side, I was also applying for student loans. Mm -hmm. Right. So I looked everywhere, looking, getting resourceful, you know, applying for scholarships, applying for loans as well. So those added to it. And I, and I started calculating, okay, now what's my gap now? <laughs> How much more money do I need? And then um, the final way that I made it happen is a um, very interesting, very resourceful, very creative thing. So you've heard of these clinical drug trials. Ah, yes, I've done yeah. one. I knew there was this connection between us. <laughs> <laughs> Which one did you do? <laughs> there was a, an, an experimental drug for cardiovascular disease. Huh. I signed up as a healthy volunteer. <laughs> and so it was a week, one week of the drug trial lasted one week. And we, as subjects, we had to be under quarantine. So in the we hospital. Were, yes, in the hospital. No ways. Yeah. Blood draws, a urine sample every single day. I was on an IV for seven days in the hospital. Quarantined, not allowed to leave, not allowed to shower. There wasn't a shower. Yeah, you know. And so Goodness. seven days locked down. And then yeah, they wake you up at night as well to take your vitals and to check your... You know? So I did the clinical drug trial and that gave me a very nice sum of money in the form of a check that's tax-free. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. And I know exactly. And you did, you did that in the UK, hey? Or... No. No, you did it in Canada. Yes, it was in Canada. 
I uh, love it. I love it. <laughs> because because I'm a citizen, right? Yes. At the time, I was I'm a citizen already. So then it it made they would accept me most likely to give me right because I was healthy volunteer and I had the, my citizenship. So they gave it to me and they could write a check legally because I'm a, a citizen. So then it worked out that way. And so then added I added my money up and it was like yes I can afford one year. Wow. Uh, one wow. year in Edinburgh. And I said, okay, that means I have one year to graduate. <laughs> what? Wow, that's so amazing. <laughs> um, wow. you, you know, what's so amazing is like, you just did what it took. You know, you, you were resourceful. Yes. You did the grunt work. And this yes. is what people don't always get, I don't think, is like, if you really do want something, people say they want something, right? They're like, oh, I'd love, I want this, so I want to do this. Yeah. But there is a way. It, it just might not be easy. You know what I mean? It, it's, yeah. it's, it might mean <laughs> drug trials or... <laughs> Or like, you know, um, doing the grunt work for, for, for other people. But look where you are now. Like, it's such a great sort of lesson. Yeah, it's true. And you know what? And, and this is what I always tell my clients is that when, when you want something and you say you want it, it doesn't matter that you say you want it. You got to look at your actions. Mm. And if you look at your actions and in, in, in the fruit in your life, the outcomes, and you still don't have what you say you wanted, then maybe it's time to really get honest with yourself. Did you really want it? in the beginning? Did you actually want it that bad? And give yourself the permission. It's okay to realize, you know what? Actually, I didn't want that. I thought I did, but I didn't. And it's okay to to say that, but to persist and keep saying, I want it, I want it. And then get depressed and upset that you still don't have it yet. It's just Mm. the cycle of, of, of destruction of, of self-sabotage, you know? Mm. And so there are, of course, I've experienced that too. I thought I wanted something and I'm, I was frustrated. I didn't have it and and envious of people who have it. And then I get brutally honest with myself and and reflect. And I realize, you know what? I actually don't want it. And I let it go. And that's Mm. one of the most honorable things and the most, the most comforting things that you can do to for yourself. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's such a great lesson, you know, just saying kind of maybe just saying no to something in a way, you know, like yeah. just, okay, cool. Maybe this is not for me. Let's just kind yeah. of move on. Um, yeah. And and it doesn't make you a bad person. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't make you unambitious. Exactly. Yeah. No, of course. No. And, and Grace, look at this stage in, in your career as well, you'd obviously, you, you know, you're moving through the ranks in academia and that kind of thing, but there was also like a lot of bureaucracy and, and actually at times you felt a bit stifled, didn't you? I did. I did. And that was when I was still hanging on to the fact that this is the example I was giving you now, but I was still hanging on to the fact that I'm going to be a professor one day, a tenured track professor at a university because I have a PhD and that's the expectation is you're successful. The measure of success, success is you become an assistant professor, and then you rise the ranks to becoming a professor. So I, I had this vision for myself. Well, I said, well I'm going to be a professor, and that's what I want because I have a PhD. And um, so I, I played the game, right? I published. I published in competitive journals. I wrote a book. I played the whole game. I, hmm. I built conf- uh, networking. You know, I built the right relationships. I went to academic conferences. I presented my work. I disseminated my findings. I, did, I played the whole game, but I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy and, and, and I wasn't fulfilled. I really wasn't. And, and the, whole, the whole environment in academia, it's, it's like a brotherhood in a way. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to get in, of course, because they have to, you have to have credentials. You have to prove that you're worthy of that of, of potential. So it's hard to get in. But it's really easy to leave. If you resign, you're out. And when you, when you leave, it's hard to get back in. Mm. <laughs> really hard to get yeah it's hard to get back in and so that's what i mean it's 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 like a brotherhood in a way and and the culture of the academic culture is very distinct it's not it's not like any business community or any organization it's just it's a very unique culture in academia and you you just kind of have to realize what's important to succeed in academia and you have to roll with the punches you have to roll with the punches and it doesn't change very much. <laughs> it's been the same for a, quite a long time. The, the academic um, track has always been the same, you know, getting good grades and GPAs and scholars, like those things are always like that classroom setting. It's evolving, but really slowly, you know, cause mm-hmm. that's just the culture of it. And you just have to be, you just have to have this, the personality for it. You have to have the mindset for it and you have to be accepting of, well, you can't make the decisions or, you know, you just mm-hmm. have to play by the rules. You just have to be okay with it. And then I realized I wasn't, 
<laughs> yeah, I realized that I wanted to define my own success. And the way I defined success was very unaligned with the values of academia. And it doesn't mean that academia sucks. I'm not saying that at all. It just means that it didn't align with my personal values. And as soon as I realized it, then I resigned and I left. Mm -hmm. It's very well unlike you to set yourself another challenge and just resign and leaving. Classic. <laughs> 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 uh, so, so, um, Obviously, you um, found your career or you went into your career kind of, I guess, straight after school and like you're quite young when you started, uh, started studying it. Um, and now you've obviously shifted on. You, you're a coach and you do you know, a few other things as well. Um, what are your thoughts, right, on what age we should sort of be choosing our profession? The, here's the thing. When I, when I hear the word age, I think there's, well, there's a chronological age. And then there's like this mental slash intellectual age and the two of them, there's no correlation. Mm. Right. And as soon as we start to think about age at which we should be doing something in terms of chronological age, that's where you can set yourself up for a lot of suffering and a lot of uh, pain and, and a lot of regret. Right. Because the moment that certain key things happen in one person's life compared to another person's life, it's going to be completely different. Mm. Right. And who's to say that you have to have all your ducks in a row at this chronological age? Right. And who's to say that you have to have it all figured out when you are blank years old? And who's to say that anyone has it figured out at all? <laughs> right. <Good one>. <laughs> <laughs> right. With the with the with the with the pace of change in today's world, the working world, the marketplace, all these industries, things are constantly changing. So you have it figured out now, one year later, all of a sudden you have to figure it out all hmm. over again. Mm -hmm. Right. So to say that you have to pick your profession at a certain age is kind of like setting yourself up for disappointment because you can't possibly do that. And, and nowadays careers are not 20, 30, 40 year tunnels. Yeah. Not, no, professions are not that way right mm -hmm. so then when even if you pick something and you go all in with it which is what you should do if you pick something you go all in all in and then one year later two years later you decide you know that's not quite what aligns with me i'm going to change it up here or i'm going to tweak that or i'm going to completely go a different path it doesn't mean you failed at picking a, a profession mm. yeah. right yeah. as long as you have a rationale for why you're changing course. As long mm. as you have that rationale and you can vocalize it and you can communicate it, it doesn't mean that you failed. It doesn't mean that at all. It can be one of your most, most valued successes that you changed direction. That totally. you did. Yeah. Instead of saying, I'm choosing to be an engineer and this better be my career for the rest of my life. Rather than locking oneself in like that, it's more about keeping an open mind about what are my blind spots? I'm picking this today and I'm going to go all on this today, but every day, every week, every month, I'm always going to be constantly evaluating what can I do better? What are my blind spots? That's so, the approach. So how do you, how do you help people then to, to understand or, or just to kind of build up uh, the courage to actually um, deal with this change and, and have this adaptability because most people say they want to do things, they don't do it. But the reason they don't do it is because I guess it's fearful, you know, fearful of, of maybe failure or what other people might think. What, uh, what do you say to people when they say that to you? Yeah, I say that it's because we're trained in, like we are trained as a society to always focus on the strategies and tactics. Right. We're, we're always trained to think about, okay, what am I going to do next? Mm. And what am I going to do? And what are the strategies to get there? I'm not, I don't have what I want right now, but I want to have this. So what do I got to do? What are the strategies to get to have that? Right. And what they're forgetting is that you can't have unless you're, you, you become, you, know, you got to mm. be, you got to become who you need to be in order to have the ability to do what you need to do. And then you can have, 
right? So I always say you got to start with what I call internal positioning. We're always so worried about how we position ourselves out there, how we're going to position to ourselves to potential employers, how we're going to position to ourselves to collaborators, to people mm. who might have a real influence on our professional future. But we forget that before we can position ourselves externally, we have to position ourselves internally. And mm. when we have a strong inner game, that's <laughs> where things get powerful out there because we're becoming, we are focusing on becoming. I mean, who is it? I think it was Oprah who said that, you know, the, some of the most successful entrepreneurs and business owners out there, some of those multimillionaires, the, the, the most successful people out there, they spend 80% of the time working on who they are. Mm. Right. So it's the who that's more important than the what I do and what I'm going to do. Yeah. So, so you're implying like personal development, uh, getting to know yourself uh, inside out, you know, th this kind of stuff. Is, is, that, is that kind of what you mean? So um, that's part, part and parcel of it. Personal development is part of it. But it's this whole bigger umbrella of an inner game, sort of like a EQ. Mm. Right, an emotional quotient. There's a mindset to it as well. There's that. There's the knowing and having a, a high degree of self awareness, right? And therefore, knowing that there's a choice to everything, mm -hmm. especially how you respond to situations that come your way. Yeah, yeah. totally. And and so many people like this is what I find like I the, for me the and Craig we talk about this a lot is like the there's a lack of self awareness like. In, in so much of like what, what people do, how they talk to, uh, to others, how they, uh, how they behave, um, just, just, there's just a lack of it, you know what I mean? And, um, but but, but what, what advice do you have for people, I guess, to, to sort of have more self-awareness? Because it's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, you basically, it's your own journey. You need to realize that you need to sort of find out more about yourself. But like, you know, do you have any kind of advice or whatever to people to, to sort of start that off? Yeah, I actually, I love questions like that. I really do because this is what I live for is to help people to expand and to grow and to expand that into living lives of fulfillment, right? And so self-awareness is a really tricky thing because there's like these, there's four pockets of what we can know of knowledge out there, right? There's things that you know that you know, right? Mm. There's things that you know you don't know. There's things that you don't know you don't know. And the fourth one is the most dangerous, is, is the scary one. There are things that are just unknowable, mm -hmm. right? And so having a high self-awareness to me means you know the boundaries of where your knowledge begins and where it ends. So you're able to have clarity. You're able to ask the right questions to know, is there something that I don't know that I don't know? possibly mm. or is there something is it possible that there, there are there are things that i know i don't know and are there things that i think i know but i actually don't know mm. <laughs> right? so one of the most dangerous things is those people who say oh i know i know and so therefore they close themselves off from further learning further development because they say i know that already yeah right? so the self-awareness comes from having that uh, I can't think of the word. It's not humility. I kind of wanted to, to, to reach for the word humility. It's not really humility. I, I guess it is in the sense that you're saying that, well, there's so much I don't know. But it's more like, um, it's more like this, uh, this holistic, yeah, a holistic perspective where there's so much that you don't know and can't know, but it's okay mm -hmm. because it's better actually to not know and ask the right questions mm -hmm. than to think you know and to stop it at that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. When, you've got, when you've got a big ego attached to thinking you know, you're less curious, you're less inclined to want to try and know more. And so, yeah, that makes, it's really um, quite succinct how you've, how you've put that because yeah. it gives you sort of a framework to, to start uh, you know, finding what, what you, you know, where you're at on that spectrum and, and being fully aware even that there's a lot of stuff you don't know. So if you're starting from that point, your curiosity will automatically sort of just improve, you know? Yeah. And in turn that, take that one level up, all of that I just talked about could be said about yourself. So in other words, things you know, you don't know, or you can't know about yourself. 
right? Yeah. And so it's like like peeling back the layers of the onion on yourself. So that's the piece about self awareness that I would say. Yeah, love it. Well, I don't know what I don't know, and I'm just confused about all these don't knows now. So, <laughs> uh, but that was a serious tongue twist. Then you did super well explaining. <laughs> I trained for it, you know. I did speech pathology. I trained for it. <laughs> That's okay. So, so Grace, you now, um, you know, you've you've both touched on it now. So, you you actually do coaching and leadership training in the form of your programs, career re- revisionist, uh, mastery insights. Can you just tell us a little bit about what you really actually do now and what your focus is these days? Yeah. So if, if I had a, if I had a 30,000 foot view, what I do is I help savvy professionals to build and create careers of significance, you know, they, where they get, you know, they, 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 they get, have more success, they have more income, they have more happiness, more joy, and expand that into living lives of fulfillment. So that, that's what I do, it, it, the 30,000 foot view of what I do. And so I've created these courses, these programs to help them at each point of each stage of their careers to help mm. them to get that. You know? and and, is, and sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Is, is this to help people um, progress in their careers um, or is it to help them like say move on from their careers and go like start businesses or it, it, is it that kind of niche or is it, is it what is it? Sorry. Okay, so it's uh, ex- career acceleration. Right? Okay. It's career acceleration, and it's like, um, and sometimes you know, I I'm, I can help I can help individuals to accelerate their career beyond the next logical step, right? So then mm. there, there's certain things that you could how you can position internally, externally, where it's like a, like a quantum leap of acceleration, not just the next logical step, you know, like incremental, but the quantum leap of acceleration. So people are when people use the term career growth and career acceleration interchangeably. And so that's okay. You can use it interchangeably, but I'm talking about leaps and bounds in your acceleration in your, in your career. And, and what these professionals have in common is that they do want more, you know, they want something better. They want more, or they want to be known for something different first. And then they want more in that, hmm. right? Cause people don't want to be, they, they don't want to have a job and then just be stagnant at that job. They want eventually after they've worked there for some time, they want more you know, more income or, or, or a better working conditions or more responsibilities, a, a higher um, title or something like that, right? So I take whatever that vision is that they have or I help them to solidify that vision and then create the blueprint to get there, right? Nice. And is this, do you help people like one-on-one? Do you help them in groups? How do you kind of like uh, structure this? Right. So there's opportunities for them to work with me on one-on-one, one-on-one if they wish. But as a starter, they, it would be in groups, but very, very intimate, very, very charged, very empowered groups very co- of communities that I've created. So there are, there's that opportunity. And of course, um, as, as people have worked with me for some time, there's opportunities they can have to do one-on-ones with me because that's where really the magic happens is when I'm there and I'm like, not just a sounding board, but I'm inducing from them their potential, inducing from them by asking very, very targeted questions then that could help them to have more clarity, more direction, and also to build that, that blueprint out, the strategic blueprint for their career moving forward. Mm, nice stuff. Well, that's a new word there. What's it? Inducing, did you say? Inducing, yeah. Inducing. I've never heard that. So, you know, oh. my, my English is not the greatest, but I, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for oh, that. So, when you, <laughs> so um, when you induce, when you induce, it's like you draw out. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I gathered that, but yeah, yeah, that's great. And thanks. I love, I, we always love using new words, Craig and I. So <laughs> I was like, that's one to for the key. I'd never heard that one either. So, yes. Uh, yeah. you know, is, you know what's Craig funny? Was standing back there, he was like, yeah, go. Okay. He's so dumb. Of course, I knew that one. But now no, no, like, no, I was going to play that game now. And then I thought, no, let me not leave you hanging there too. Much. <laughs> <laughs> that's what buddies are all about. I love it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is one of those things. It was one of those things that I did back then where I said, okay, one of the ways that I needed to be competitive to get scholarships was I needed to be more fluent in English, right? So I studied the dictionary. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, oh, amazing. Wow. Yeah. I needed to expand my vocabulary because, you know, when you're, when you're competing for scholarships, you have to write essays, you have to do exam, you have to do these, like, these tests as well. So I was like, okay, I need to give myself the best chance. So I studied this dictionary and one in particular is not just 
a regular Oxford dictionary. It's the Oxford Dictionary of Difficult Words. No way. Awesome. That's so no cool. way. I didn't even know it existed. Yeah, I even have. I still have it right here. Okay, cool. Give us a, really? what, what are two of your other favorite words? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one word that I use often is uh, lackadaisical. Okay, cool. Nice. I like that. Nice. Yeah, a deuce is another one I use very often. Um, or dilapidated. Yes, dilapidated. Nice, nice yeah. words. These are good words. Great words. <laughs> Cool you, you, you must be a whiz uh, when you're playing Scrabble. <laughs> I love Scrabble. <laughs> no one wants to play with Dr. Grace. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is classic. So, so, so anyway, um, Dr. Grace, um, besides the obvious, you know, and uh, I guess that means making money, why do you think like people work? You know, what, what is it like intrinsically, you know? See, that's the thing that, that the reason is and should be different for everyone. And I challenge this. I challenge the notion. And I ask, I ask everyone to, to ask the question, why are you working? And this is this video I created I, where I open the video by saying, why are you working? If you're saying it's because you want to pay the bills and make money to pay the bills, then you've lost sight of your vision and you've lost sight of your dreams. Right? If that's the reason why you're working and that's the only reason why you're working is to make money mm. to pay the bills, you've lost sight of your dreams, right? So the reason why we're working is a very individual reason. And so that's where self-awareness comes about is you have to have clarity on what is that reason for me? Truly the reason for me, not what someone else told me my reason should be, mm -hmm. okay. right? It's true, authentically your reason. And when you have that reason, it's the why that I told, that I talked about earlier. When you're connected to that, nothing will stop you. Yeah. And, and how do you deal with like, say excuses? Like, you know, people are like, well, you know, I can't cause I got this and that and whatever. Like that, that is often a kind of like a standard line, I guess that, that people say. Yeah, it's true. They do. I remind them. I remind them in a loving way that words are very powerful. Words are very powerful. When you say something like I can't, it's very powerful and it means something, right? So when you utter those words, subconsciously it does something it registers because you said them yourself and you said them what your words come from your heart you say it, you speak it from your mouth your your ears hear it in your mind it does something subconsciously so be careful when you say that i can't and what comes after i can't also when you say i am what comes after i am that's also very powerful these are like statements you can empower yourself and you can disempower yourself in one word in one phrase right so that's the first thing i tell them and, 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 and of course, I can't, I can't crack the whip on them. And I don't do that, right? But I'm, I, I, I try to empower and I try to ask questions to get to the bottom of why these excuses exist. And there's always a reason. Mm. And the reason is unbeknownst to them. More often than not, it's unbeknownst to them. And so when I draw it to their awareness and they say it, I don't say it. They say it. So I'm educing the answer, <laughs> right? <laughs> then they take ownership of it. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. That's lovely. And, and um, Grace, the, the meaning of success is obviously a question that, it, it, like you say, is a very individual thing. Do you have a sort of a, a broad overview of what you think success looks like? Yes, I do. I do. Of course, that definition for me has evolved over the years. It really has. And I, I keep track of how it has evolved and how it began and, and, and in, in moments in my life where I made this definition and it was not a healthy definition of success. Yeah. It's happened. And I, and I make, and I make um, a document them because it's important. It's my journey, right? I document yeah. it. But today for today, my definition of success is being able to impact people right? To be able to help them and to show them that they are designers and creators of their own destiny, right? And I do this by getting them to realize that, you know, your career is not there for you just to make money and make a living. Your career is actually the greatest form of expression of who you are and the impact you want to have in this world. And so my definition of success is if I can get that message out there to 1 million people, and there are 1 million dream careers and lives that are created out of it. <laughs> I love that. It's very powerful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and I think we, we very much agree with that. When you, when you involve others in, a, in your idea of success and helping someone else in some way, shape, or form, 
that's definitely resonates a lot with us. I think there's, it's um, too many people are, are very selfish about what they're doing and that's, it's not ultimately gratifying when, um, when it's all about you, 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 you know, me, 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 you know what I mean? So, um, yeah. So just moving on to like some of the concepts that you talk about, uh, Grace is you, you speak about sort of business acumen being uh, a good thing for life in general and, and not just for being a business businessman or woman or an entrepreneur. Can you maybe just give us an idea of, of um, what that means? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I strongly believe, like I believe that when you are building your career, when you're building your life, it's the, the, the principles that you use to build that career, a successful career or a lucrative career or a meaningful career those principles, it's much the same as building a business, right? And if you want to build a great career, then even more so, it's going to be similar to building a great business. And you look at businesses out there, startup businesses or businesses that were bootstrapped by their, by their, their business owners or entrepreneurs. The statistics in, in Canada anyway, in British Columbia anyway, um, mm-hmm. and I'm sure that it reflects across the world as well, is that most of them don't make it past the first year, right? The first year mm-hmm. of of a business owner of a startup is critical. If you pass that first year, then you know you get they they taper off really quickly, and for many reasons, for so many reasons, because so much goes into building a business, and building a great business is even harder. Yeah, right? because there's a lot of people who can copy you now with the information age. Yeah. They can copy you, and everyone could be like, "Oh, you do that? Me too, me too." And then they can copy you, and they can copy your pricing structure and everything, and mm. the same. And this, so the same thing is true of your career, right? So what can you do to set yourself apart? Same thing is true for a business. And why do customers buy from a business? The same thing is true for your career. Why do people want to hire you? Why do employers, potential companies as well, why would they want to hire you more than your competitors out there? And so if you look at that journey, right, the journey of, to, of choosing a candidate into in, in the hiring relationship. It's similar to the journey a customer, a consumer takes to deciding to purchase from a product from a, uh, one company over another. It's very similar, right? So then, and, and if you look at the, the statistics on why consumers end up choosing a, a product from one company over another, it's like 60 to 70% is from warm referrals, mm. right? Same thing with hiring. Why do you mm. think there's a hidden job market out there? Why do you think that the hidden job market is much bigger than jobs that are advertised or posted online? And the mm. unadvertised jobs are some of the most coveted jobs out there. They're the most desirable, the most highest paid, the, the ones that truly have an influence on the business. They're the ones that are unadvertised because they go first to the inner circle, right? Yeah. They go first to the warm referrals, yeah. So the structures, the principles are very similar between starting a business starting a career, growing a business, growing a career, and scaling a business and accelerating a career. It's very similar. So this, is, this, has been, this is my message, right? And so in my courses, in my coursing, in my coaching, I'm, I'm teaching people these principles. You know, I'm teaching my clients the principles on business development, you know, business scaling, business systems, and I translate it for them into here's what it looks like when you are going along your career journey. Here's how you apply it, right? So like, it's like, it's like an applied science. Here's how you apply it. And I do the work for them. Here's what you do. Here's, here's how you do it. And of course, there's some tailorization that needs to happen. There's some customization that needs to happen because everyone's history is different. But it's just, it's about just tailoring. Right? Mm. The principles are more important than the strategy. You have to have those first before you focus on the strategy. Yeah, you do for sure. And um, it's interesting just listening to you there, like some things which kind of stand out about what you were saying, like, you know, trust is so important in this day and age, you know, and that's why people will do business with you or will refer because they trust you as a person. And I think that's so important for people to realize, you know, how you act and how you are with other people is like, it's going to really represent you as a person, you know, and um, uh, that's, that's what people are going to use to kind of to refer you and, and to do business with you. And um, it was interesting that you said as well about the, that, that job market, the, the kind of unadvertised one, you know, and it's because like I used to work in corporates and, and they always used to have these massive amounts of like 
money for referrals and you're like, wow, how can you like sort of pay that much? You know, like, but it's, um, it's because you're also cutting out the, the sort of recruitment consultants and stuff. It's very interesting. Like now it just kind of makes sense why they also offer that because you know, it's uh, it is such a big market, that referral system. Um, so, so yeah, but anyway, so, so it was a bit of a side thing, but anyway, um, you uh, obviously have, uh, you know, worked as a, as a brain scientist, but like, how do you, or what, what advice do you have for people to have like a healthy brain, you know, like um, in terms of, yeah, just helping them out for, for themselves and their overall health? Right. I love that question because you reminded me of something I forgot to say earlier. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> in addition to helping my clients and these individuals, helping them to understand the principles of business development, how it applies to their career. Another key factor is brain science. And now, I'm, and now I can answer your question, right? Cool. <laughs> Neuro, neuroscience is everywhere because everywhere you go, there's humans involved. You can say you're applying to a company, but a company is made of people and everyone has a brain. And there's human psychology. There are rules to human psychology. There are fundamentals and there are principles to human behavior, right? So then it's about having that healthy healthiness. First of all, is, 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 it means that you have this sub -level, a level of self-awareness and you have that EQ that you can weather the storm and you're choosing constantly and knowing and choosing with intent your reactions to things that come your way because of the EQ aspect of it. But at the same time, when I teach my clients to accelerate their career, I'm using brain science in it because I understand from a science perspective why people do the things that they do. Mm -hmm. And when you understand why you do the things that you do, that's where the magic happens. That's where you can avoid mistakes you've made before. That's where you can understand what you did well before and 10 times, 10x that thing mm. because of human behaviors. And we're all subject to habits. We're all subject to temptations. We're all subject to a lack of willpower. All of these things are part of being human. And so that's why neuroscience is so deeply ingrained in what I do and how I help my clients as well. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah. It's fascinating. And I mean, like you say, it's day to day. You just forget that your brain and your health and, and these things are, are just, they're just there until they're not. And, um, and so it's such a great thing that you sort of bring that into the, the fold when, you, when you're discussing these things, because at the end of the day, that, comes, that is first and foremost, before anything else happens, is, is that health. So um, do you have anything specific that you say, look, if, because you want to have a healthy brain in the future, you want to be able to um, keep you know, moving into, as we get older, we kind of want to look after it. Are there any little tips and tricks? Because you see these apps on the phone, you know, like brain training and this kind of stuff. Is that, is that like a thing or, or is there a specific strategy that you have or anything like that? Uh, so it's great to have these apps. Mm. I mean, there are, there's a group of scientists, there are cohorts of research labs that are trying to delineate whether or not they are of use at all. And if they are to what age group, that kind of thing. And of mm. course, with studies like that, they have to be longitudinal studies. And then there's sometimes they conduct it differently and it doesn't really reflect real life. And there's a lot of criticisms that with experimentations on that. But here's the thing, what we know for sure is that nothing beats experiences. Nothing beats real lived in experiences. So giving yourself new experiences, new challenges, meaningful challenges is way to keep a brain healthy. Mm. Right. And not That's to awesome. say to yourself, yeah. And not to set limitations and saying, well, I'm older now, or I'm, I'm mm. over 50 now. So it's hard for me to learn new things and then playing it safe. Right. That, that, that is like, that is self-limiting thinking. It's rather to recognize that I need to be, I want to, because I, I want to, and I'm choosing to be constantly growing. You know, I'm, and I know that my brain can handle it. So giving yourself these meaningful challenges and new experiences and having the courage to do so, that's the best way to keep a brain healthy or your whole self healthy as well. Uh, healthy as well. Hmm. That's amazing. I remember at university, I had a, new, uh, a neuroscientist or, or a um, neurology lecturer and I just remember how many amazing facts like you have about the brain and uh, I've always said to Gareth like one of the things was and I never forget it he's like after 10 o'clock you can just forget it your brain will never study after that it's you're going to be too tired it shuts down 
So just so I never ever my whole study career never studied past ten o'clock because I took his his word like as yeah. as gospel. <laughs> and the other thing he taught me, and, and this I actually think is quite is quite smart. Like you always said, like if you're studying, you should, um, as you said it earlier, actually is like if you're studying, you should always say things out loud as well because when you're thinking it and when your ear actually hears it, it it's two different parts of the brain, and mm-hmm. so you actually cre- you're actually remembering better because you're using more engaging more parts of your brain so people like you have got so much like crazy information that that we can use day to day to actually make our lives uh, better so i think it's great that you incorporate that stuff awesome it's yeah awesome. and craig i think that uh, that 10 p.m thing for you like you know like there's there's another switch whenever 10 p.m comes you just get tired no matter what but, like you know but there's this that's never gone crazy. away there's this look on Craig's face at 10 o'clock. Seriously, Grace, you just like, you can see, okay, cool. We, let's wrap Done. things up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <Done. Craig> is- <laughs> it seems like he was super successful at pre-programming your, your physiology. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this low so clock. <laughs> you know that I can't, I like, I can't go far. Well, I am tired. You know, those yeah. words I use all the time, Grace. Yeah. <laughs> it's his morning affirmation. He's like, uh, tonight at 10 p.m. I will definitely go to sleep again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So does that mean you're a morning person then? A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, much, awesome. much more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I also like have. I mean, we're joking about it, but you know, like you just you get into your habits and like you were talking about those your patterns that you follow. And yeah. um, I suppose I just wake up earlier, go to bed earlier. So as long as I'm getting you know enough sleep, and I you know sleep's obviously important for the brain too. And uh, yeah, I do find that I just start to shut down at a certain time. Whether that's programmed or, or just because I'm tired, I don't know. <laughs> well, being a morning person is great too, right? There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of research out there that shows that you know morning meditations and and morning rituals are very healthy, very good for you, and and to keep your performance up too. Mm, yeah, it certainly helps me. That's for sure. Yeah. So, um, so Grace, just before we ask you your sort of last question, um just to sort of two things, what are you excited about, you know, moving into the future and, and, and what will you be doing more of? And, and then afterwards you can tell us where people can contact you. Sure. What I'm excited about is really what's to come in the world of work now, because I mean, there's new technologies that are, that are just on the brink of being released and, and, to the masses, right? And some of these technologies are going to be phenomenal in terms of shaping the way we communicate. Now it's pretty phenomenal too. I mean, if you, if you could really measure the lag time between the words coming out of my mouth, through the microphone, through this chat, and then to your ears, it's actually a fraction of a second, right? Mm. And so in the future, it's going to be so much better that it's almost going to be instant, instant, right? And that is going to cause a lot of shifts and positive changes to the way we build relationships, the way people hire as well, the way people can convey emotions and convey connections on online like this, right? So I'm really excited about what's to come in terms of how people can build meaningful relationships with one another across the world, how they can collaborate and take my message for, you know, my message of creating fulfillment and another person's message of, you know, building um, something meaningful to them and how we can collaborate in ways we could never before. Mm. Like, you know, this whole web of empowered people all around the world and creating this super community that's charged and full of life and that's on fire. That's what I'm really excited about. Mm -hmm. And I, and I really believe that the people who are and are going to embrace that. Of course, there's going to be pitfalls to everything, right? But the people who can truly embrace that and use it for the greater good and not for manipulation and not for self-serving purposes and really use that for the greater good, I mean, that's how we improve society. And I'm super excited about that because mm. I believe that that's just simply a choice to do that. Mm. And it's easy to make a choice, just like we choose what we're going to have for dinner, right? So I, I, I'm super excited for what's to come with that and now i forgot the second part of the question so, so and, and what do you what will you be doing moving forward and uh and also where can people contact you 
Right. So moving forward, I'm building out more, more multimedia programs to work with people in terms of helping them with their careers, their trajectories, and also the envisionment of creating a life of fulfillment and leaving a legacy. Right. So all of it, you know, human, as we, as human beings, we want to leave behind something meaningful. We want to know that we've touched lives, that we've had a footprint in this world and what we did matters at the end of the day. That's what gives us fulfillment. There was one time I, w- I was volunteering for many years at um, a hospital in, in a pavilion called the Banting Pavilion, which was made up of elderly folks who were in long-term care at the hospital. So they had illnesses that, uh, that required their hospitalization for long periods of time. And these were senior citizens. And I was a volunteer. And my role as a volunteer was just to go and talk to them. Literally, it was just to, take, to, to have conversations with them. Because a lot of these elderly they were kind of like neglected by their families or they didn't have family and they were alone in the hospital and just basically waiting to waiting for their final moments. So uh, my role, I had my vest on my volunteer pin on my chest and I just went and I, and I had to just have conversations with people. And so I talked to elderly people on a daily basis for a couple hours at a time. And some of the stories that I heard were just phenomenal. They lived amazing lives. But one thing that a common theme that I heard was that one of the biggest regrets, you know, they're, they're, they would admit that they're at their end of their life right now and they're just waiting for the moment, you know, that kind of thing. And they would say that they wished that they lived a life more authentic and true to themselves. Mm-hmm. That there were certain things that they didn't do that they kind of wish they did because they kind of denied themselves that authenticity, you know? And so, for me, it's like, that's the legacy you want to leave behind. The message that it's possible to be the creator of your own destiny and to have fulfillment and to make money doing it, right? Mm. So this is what I'm looking forward to is what I'm working on next is getting my message out there with more reach and helping people on that level, on that high level even more with, with different programs, with multimedia, with uh, different platforms, you know, everything. Cool. Awesome. And, and where, can, where can people get hold of you to, to find out more about your programs and, and the work that you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, there's, uh, there's two websites. Uh, one of them is masteryinsights.com and the other one is careerrevisionist.com. And both of those websites, I mean, they're, they're, they're different and they're related at the same time. And all of both of those websites, there's like my social links are there. So if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, that is there. Facebook is there. Like all of the social links are there as well. Beautiful. Cool. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks a lot. We'll, we'll put all, everything in our show notes and stuff so everyone can get hold of you and, and uh, yeah, get in touch. So, so our last question is, um, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? <laughs> I was looking forward to this question. <laughs> I really was. I've been looking forward to this question because I'm, awesome. I'm a fan of your podcast and, and, and I'm aware that you, you finished with this question. I said, you know what? That's an amazing you. question. And it's interesting because I shared with you that I studied the dictionary, right? If you look at the word ridiculous, <laughs> if you look at the word ridiculous, the origin, of course, a lot of English words have Latin roots to it. And the word origin for ridiculous is kind of like laughable, right? Something that's laughable, right? And so when I think about ridiculously human, what's so laughable about being human, right? And so human, human, be- human beings, homo sapiens, we're on, we're a creature in this world, like other animals that we know of, or that we even that we don't know of, right? So we're mm. one example of living creatures in this world. Mm. And you look at all the other living creatures out there in kingdom, in the kingdom Animalia, right? We're, the, we're in part of the same kingdom. Kingdom Animalia, they have, like, some of these animals out there, they have such incredible physiologies, you know, they, you, can, you can lose a limb and they grow it back or their skin <laughs> changes color or their eyelids have a, 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 they blink two ways, you know, or they can camouflage, you know. So they have all these phenomenal physiological, physical things. But humans don't, right? Our, our, our human bodies are very simple and they're very fragile in many things. And from an engineering perspective, you might say, well, our joints were designed very poorly, yeah. right? And, and it's true, right? So, but... What makes us different from all the other creatures in this world is our ability to choose, 
Mm-hmm. And it's that choice that gets us in trouble too, because oftentimes we don't realize we have a choice. <laughs> And so that's what makes it so funny, so laughable. Because when you look at the way animals behave, every single thing that they do, they're all in. Yeah. Everything. There is no laxadaisical nature to them. Every single thing. And, and, and how you do one thing is how you do everything. And animals, not humans, other animals, they, whatever they do, whether they are barking or wagging their tails or something simple like that, they're all in on it. <laughs> But humans, we're like dabbling, we're like oh, making excuses, we're lackadaisical in this and that, because we don't realize the power of our mind is more powerful than our bodies. Mm-hmm. So to me, that is what's being ridiculously human. <laughs> Beautiful. I love it. <laughs> Amazing answer. Yeah. Thanks for putting so much thought into it. <laughs> and we have these big brains that you're so interested in, and that makes us so different as well, hey? <laughs> yeah. Our power is all there. It's not in our bodies, our physical bodies. Like any animal can claw us to death and eat us alive, you know? (laughs) So soft and squishy. (laughs) (laughs) So the power is right there in our mind. And that's the only thing we can have control of in this world, really. I love it. And uh, look, uh, Dr. Grace Lee, you have been an amazing uh, guest on our show. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence today, it really, it's, it's, it's quite hard to sort of articulate with, you know, how succinct you are and how uh, concise you are with your words, you know, from the beginning, I just noticed that you, you sort of, you pick up on individual words uh, that, that you've asked or said, and, and that's a real skill. You actually really are listening. And so thank you for that. That's a, that's quite um, noticeable as well about you. And, and, and I guess off the back of that, it, it, there's this warmth that comes from you that emanates from you. And, you know, I guess coming from your, your history or your background, um, it's almost like you've doubled down on that, on that warmth and that caring nature that you exude. And, you know, sometimes someone coming from academia can, you know, this is a real generalization, but has a sort of a low uh, EQ we find, you know, sometimes, you know, it's, it's hard to engage because they're so smart or, or whatever it is, but, but you certainly not, not like that at all and you know you've you're very engaging and uh, and like i said calming so your message is a massive one of hope thank you for that like you, you just bring a lot of excitement for the future and uh the, the fact that we have so many choices in our lives are uh is a, is a real hopeful thought and you can come from a background like you and still thrive and still look to to just go to places that you never thought were possible so just thank you so much from from our side and and We just can't wait to see what you're up to in the future. Thank you. It's been my absolute honor. It was such a pleasure talking to you as well. And I, yeah, I look forward to your next episodes as well. And so thank you for having me. That's so cool. And, uh, and just uh, from me as well, Dr. Grace, uh, well, I've induced so much from this conversation, seriously. And, um, you know, I hope you noticed that I used the word induced there. <laughs> um, but it's um, not quite the word, though, is it? Induced. What is it? Educe. Educed. I've educed. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it when I said it. I was like, damn, that doesn't sound right. Okay, let me start again. <laughs> well, Dr. Grace Lee, I've seriously induced so much from this conversation. Um, it really has been such an amazing chat. Uh, you, you just have this epic energy about you and this charm. Um, I can only imagine that, that people work with you just like, they just feel super engaged and they just like want to be working with you, you know, because uh, not only are you energetic um, and positive, but you're also just super smart. And, uh, you know, like the, the, the words you use, uh, you know, how you speak, um, everything is just so succinct and, um, it's just been, yeah, it's just been such a fantastic chat and, you know, listening to your story and what you've gone through, uh, like Craig says, is, um, true hope for every single person in this world, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, uh, we must never give up on what our dreams and our desires are. Um, and we must never forget that hard work will definitely get us everywhere in life. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, it was just an absolute honor. 
and uh, yeah, just wishing you all the best with absolutely everything that you that you do, and super happy that we've you know been able to connect with you, and really looking forward to our you know future relationship. So so thanks again. Thank you. Appreciate mm-hmm. it very much. <laughs> cool. Pleasure. All right, Grace. Thank you. Cool. All right. So we just picking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air, stop at the toll, digging.